Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on Earth Day. We are very honored to be able to present Kendra Atley work to be presenting her book, Miracle Country. And I have a copy of the book right here for you to um, be able to check out from the Pasadena Public Library. It's also on the Pasadena Public Library's Hoopla. It's an ebook and an e-audiobook. So if you haven't had a chance to read this wonderful memoir, you can read it immediately after the program, which is the advantage for Hoopla, or you can request to pick up a book curbside. So it's just a few minutes after five o'clock, so I'll wait to make sure everybody has an opportunity to get in and join us this um, afternoon. It's rather, um, what we might call kind of cool, cold, or kind of drizzly this morning in, in Pasadena. And I understand it's up in the low 80s, maybe, or it's a lot warmer in Bishop, where Kendra is. And we're just honored that she is joining us today for this program on Earth Day. So I want to go ahead and start and tell you a little bit about what Earth Day is. Earth Day is an annual event on April 22nd to demonstrate support for environmental protection. It was first held on April 22, 1970, 51 years ago. It is now includes a wide range of events coordinated globally by earthday.org, including 1 billion people in more than 193 countries around the world. In 1969, at a UNESCO conference in San Francisco, peace activist John McConnell proposed a day in honor of Earth and the concept of peace to first be observed on March 21, 1970, the first day of spring in the Northern Hemisphere. This day of nature's exospose was later sanctioned and a proclamation written by McConnell and signed by Secretary General Fant at the United Nations. A month later, a United Nations Senator, Gaylord Nelson, proposed the idea to hold a nationwide, uh, and Irina, <laughs> I can't pronounce it right, um, teach-in on April the 22nd, 1970. He hired a young activist, Dennis Hayes, to be the national coordinator, national, Nelson and Hayes renamed the event Earth Day. Dennis and his staff grew the event beyond the original idea for a teach-in to include the entire United States. More than 20 million people poured out on the streets and the first Earth Day remains the largest single day protest in human history. And today we are continuing with our Earth Day celebration. As I said, we are honored that Kendra Adderley has accepted the library's invitation to be talking about her memoir, Miracle Count Country. And as I said, the book is available in hardback at the library, also on Hoopla as an ebook and an e-audio book. It is a memoir about her journey of her life so far, there is a wonderful map in the front of the book that gives you um, a description of how Los Angeles up to the Owens Valley. Um, there is a wonderful research and inspiration section. And the beginning of the book, there are chapters and the chapters are titled. So it's a very wonderful book to be presenting for Earth Day. Her description passages are absolutely wonderful. She starts off her book with a sentence that I think gives you an idea. This chapter is called Kindling. The valley lay dry that winter and the re wind roared over the mountains. February 2015 marked the fourth year of bad drought in California, the worst in more than a millennium and the jet stream raced over the Sierra Nevada range and hit the floor of the Owens Valley as it usually does 
a few times a month in winter. You can see how wonderful her descriptive passages are. Kendra will be reading some other chapters for us and other passages in the book for you to get an idea of the detail in her book. She also does lots and lots of wonderful California history throughout the book relating to the Owens Valley and Bishop and the state of California. Kendra Adderley was born and raised on the dry edge of California at the eastern base of the Sierra Nevada mountains. She moved away for a decade, mostly spent being homesick and researching the place she left behind. The product of which is her first book, Miracle Country. It's winner of the Sigrid F. Olson Nature Writing Award and 2021 pick for the statewide program, Nevada Reads. Kendra is a graduate of Scripps College in 2011, and she holds an MFA in writing from the University of Minnesota. She has been rewarded fellowships and residencies from the Bread Writers Conference, the Anderson Center, and the Minnesota State Arts Board. Her writing has appeared in Best American Essays, The Atlantic, The Los Angeles Times, she is a recipient of Ellen Malloy Fund for Desert Writers Award, and she lives in her hometown of Bishop, California, where she can be found roaming the mountains and desert and growing a big garden. So today's program um, is going to be put on the Pasadena Public Library's YouTube channel so that you can um, watch it after the program and you can encourage your friends to watch it as well for an Earth Day celebration. In order to have optimal zooming, um, please continue to have you, uh, your computer on mute. Also chat will be private with me. Please put your chat in the box in the little chat box and I will ask the questions at the end of the program. So as I said, this book had lots and lots of California history in it. So Kendra, how did you research all of that wonderful California history? And how did you approach including it in a memoir? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's really great to be talking to folks. Um, thanks, Christine, and thanks a lot to the Pasadena Public Library. Um, I went to college in Claremont, so pretty nearby. I was often driving through Pasadena, had some friends who lived there. Uh, it's a beautiful city and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so Miracle Country, it kind of merges. So I'm gonna show you the cover of the paperback. The paperback will be out on June 1st. I just got this in the mail and I feel like it does kind of a good job, the cover of sort of summing up uh, the, the research element and the family story. So. That's actually me and my dad, a, a friend snapped this picture when I was in college, never dreamed it would wind up on the cover of a book. And then the designer at the publisher, Algonquin, did the rest of this, like photoshopped us into this, um, this layout. And so Miracle Country is really a, it's a merging of my family story with the story of the place that shaped me and my family. So I live in Bishop, which is in the Eastern Sierra Nevada. It's really near Mammoth. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. Um, and I was born, born and raised here. And when I was 16, my, so my family raised me to just roam around in the desert and catch lizards and all sorts of stuff. Um, I lived partway up the mountains, 30 minutes out of a town. Um, and when I was 16, my mom died. And then all of a sudden this desert that had been such a, such a source of sustenance and, and, and beauty, it became really empty. It became um, kind of a place I needed to flee. And I left, I went to LA, I went to San Diego, and then I went even farther from California. I had to get away from California altogether. I was sort of running away from difficult memories and uh, sort of a troubled family. I went to Minneapolis and in Minneapolis, I went to graduate school for writing. And that's when I started thinking about home. I started thinking about not only my own family, but also the way the landscape had informed our family culture and the way history had kind of fed into that. And I started researching. So I started looking into the water, the history of the water transfer. So as many of you will probably know, starting in 1913, the water from Owens Valley 
began to be transported up to 270 miles south to Los Angeles. And that's still the case. So Los Angeles at large still gets on average, it varies year to year, but about a third of its water from Owens Valley. Um, when it's not a drought, when it's a drought, stuff gets more complicated and very tense. So I knew that that was happening and I had grown up with the knowledge that the water in my valley went away. And I also grew up with visitors from Southern California millions of them actually coming through every year and i was a waitress in local restaurants and so i interacted with visitors that way and it was a really strange position to be in to be in this place that people loved and really loved visiting but they didn't really know its relationship to their own city um, and so i started researching about that and i grew up with a sense of loss that this water was gone and taken but i really didn't know the details so for miracle country i did tons of interviews. I spent a lot of time in the archives of museums um, and I read a ton of history books. I dug into old newspapers. Um, I got newspapers on microfilm, which is like you can kind of zoom around on it on this old, old, old university computer system where you can kind of zoom in on these digitized really old newspapers from the 1800s, early 1900s. So I poured through those. Um, I listened to oral histories both with people that were involved in the water transfer, people that were involved in the earliest ranching days in my valley, people that were settling early Los Angeles, and a lot of indigenous people, their stories um, as well about the genocide that took place in Owens Valley and also what life was like before the ranchers showed up. So all of that stuff, I just was absorbing all of that. I have a 500 source bibliography on my website um, that's uh, cited for all the things that I, all the information that I cite in the book. So I loved doing the research. It was really enriching and it was totally necessary in order to tell my own family's story um, as well as the story of the place that, that shaped us. Well, what a research you've done and you can tell all of your research by your bibliography and reading your book because you go through a family saga and a description part and then you talk about the history and how the history of California ties into it. And I think the part that you have about water and um, Mulholland and how it affected the Owens Valley and how he brought the water to California, everybody knows about that pretty much from the movie Chinatown. And so it really um, helped us put that into context more um, about um, that area and your book. So. I also see that you received two California CLA, which I assume travel research fellowships and two or work fellowships to research the book. And you've said how detailed and how many 500 bibliographic resources you had. And then you traveled up and down the California um, coast and the California inland with a photographer observing dry reservoirs and fallowed fields during severe, severe drought. Can you talk about that journey up and down the state of California? Yeah, that was, um, that was in 2015. And so, I, let's see, it was the summer of 2015. No, it was the summer of 2014. It was right in the heart of the California drought that you will all recall. Um, it was a traumatic time for all of us. And I was in Minnesota, and so I was in graduate school, and I was working on this book, and meanwhile, California was drying up and every, it, all anybody could talk about when I would call home or when I would go home for Christmas or something was the drought, the drought, the drought. In San Luis Obispo, where my grandparents lived, in Bishop, where my dad and brother lived, that's, that was on everybody's mind. My dad's well had gone dry um, and that was a really big deal and he was without water for months, which is in the book. And so I started thinking, you know, I want to I want to come back and kind of witness this in California. And I, I was in Minnesota where it was like constantly snowing and wet and humid. And that took a while to get used to. Um, and I thought I want to go back to California. So I got a research grant from my university. I took along a photographer and we camped up and down. We were just hanging out in like really rural places and really small towns up and down the California coast for two weeks and took pictures and did interviews with people um, who were being affected by the drought. So I talked to a shepherd who had made the decision to sell off a large portion of his flock because his options were to overgraze his pasture lands, which would cause erosion and a bunch of damage to the land in future years, 
or sell off, take a, take a, a financial hit and sell off part of his flocks. And he'd made the decision to sell the flocks because he was thinking of the long term. He was thinking of the big picture and what was best for this place that he, he needed to have a reciprocal relationship with in order to continue to do what he did in the future. And I thought that was really interesting. And that got me thinking, how else, how have we succeeded in having that kind of reciprocal relationship with our landscape and how have we failed as a state and as a culture so a lot of that is in the book is me thinking about that and also not letting myself off the hook but thinking about my own role um, in that kind of system and growth and boosterism um, and and thinking about where it where it has brought us and where it's going to lead us in the future well your um, history and description of those that journey and the it was basically 1400 miles, it says in the book that you traveled around looking and talking to everybody um, for your research for the book. But it also said um, you were in Minneapolis and you flew home immediately after a very bizarre winter wildfire destroyed a third of the houses in um, Swall Meadows. Um, your father, I understand, actually lived in Swall Meadows but actually had a home in Bishop as well. And um, he wasn't so sure that the fire would be as extensive and wasn't able to take a lot of his um, memories with him, his scrapbooks. But, um, and it was devastation on the homes around you, though your home did not burn. Can you talk about, that was a terrible chapter and a memory in your book. Yeah, so that's the, that's the opening chapter, the chat. The book Miracle Country begins with a wildfire and I am in Minneapolis, so almost 2000 miles away and I'm getting these phone calls from people, Swall Meadows is, you know, there's this fire, it's moving up the mountain. My dad, um, after my mom died and my brother and sister and I moved out, my dad felt too isolated and lonely up in Swall Meadows because it's, it's a little neighborhood, it's half an hour from a town, it's in the middle of nowhere and it's on the side of the mountain. I'm looking at it out my window right now. Um, and he felt too isolated up there. So he moved down to Bishop and he hadn't sold our childhood home yet because that was going to be kind of an emotional thing to do was the site of all of our memories of my mom. And he instead he rented it out. Um, and so it was at it was at that time vacant of tenants for a brief period, actually. And but meanwhile, it had been like a temporary vacation rental, he would rent it out to vacationers. So it had all of our stuff in it as if we still lived in it, we just really, none of us had quite been able to move out of it in that sense, because it was too emotional. So he is down in Bishop, which is on the valley floor and Swall Meadows is up on the mountain. So he's down here, the fire is up here. He's watching the fire sweep into Swall Meadows. He drives as close as he can get. Of course, the roads are blocked off and he's on the phone with me and he's narrating the whole thing to me. And I'm in Minneapolis, it's the middle of the night. I'm just completely beside myself because I'm imagining my home, my childhood home where I grew up and which was the site of all my memories of my mom, just violent, violent destruction via fire. So I spent a night thinking that my house burned because the, there was actually a fire tornado leaping from house to house in Swall Meadows and we thought everything had burned. And in the morning, found out it hadn't, but many of my close neighbors' homes had burned. Um, so I flew home immediately and was like in the first group of cars to be let back in, the ground still smoking and sifted through the ash with the neighbors who had lost their homes and kind of processed all of that as a community. So that was sort of the opening chapter of Miracle Country and it sort of set the stage to think about sort of how we are, we can be so attached to these places and they can be so perilous and so I, I felt like I just wanted to protect my home but I couldn't. I felt so helpless in that moment but I also really was reminded through that experience um, of how precious of a thing that I had, how, how precious our homes really are. And I mean our houses but also our community and our landscape at large. Right, and you go on to describe in that chapter later on about how it is to sift through and help your neighbors to go through all of their belongings and the emotion that comes from that and what that means to you and how it, it actually impacts everything else that you do. So um, you also have a history about a lady that I'm not too familiar with in your book. Her name is Mary Austin. And she wrote a book in 1892. Um, can you tell us a little bit about her or how um, you came to include her in your 
all of this research? Did you know about her originally or through her, your research you discovered her? Yeah, so Mary Austin is a writer. She was really ahead of her time in a lot of ways. And her most famous book is called Land of Little Rain. And it was published in 1904. She wrote other books as well, but this was her most famous one. It was published in 1904. And she wrote it while she was living in my valley, the valley where I live, Owens Valley, um, Payahunadu is the indigenous name for it. And that means land of flowing waters. So she was living in this, this desert valley um, before the water was taken, when it was actually a, a thriving agricultural valley. So she watched the change. She watched it go from having water to not having water. And she was close friends with a lot of the Paiute people. And she watched the devastation that happened to them even more so when the water left. And so she had a really interesting perspective and she wrote it. She wrote, her book is beautiful. It's very short, Land of Little Rain. It's a series of short essays about the California desert. And it feels like, it feels ahead of its time as far as nature writing goes. And they're almost like, prose poems. They're just beautiful and short. Um, and there's some gorgeous lines. And I'll actually, I'll read to you a little bit about my interaction with, with Mary Austin and how she fit in with my family story, because she was a way for me to connect to my own valley at a different point in time, but also sort of to think about my relationship with my mom, who I'd lost when I was pretty young. So I'll read a little section about how Mary Austin fits into our story. Mary Austin often wrote about herself in the third person, not as I, but as Mary, an understanding of herself as singular and contained, a version of herself who transcends the worries of ordinary life to commune with something larger, a self she called I, Mary, came to Mary Austin when she was four years old. Quote, there was the familiar room, the flurry of snow outside, mama kneading bread, Mary in her flannel frock and blue chambray pinafore, and inside her, I, Mary, looking on. Imagine I, Mary, grown up and in the desert, the chatter of the schoolhouse of her own mind, suffused by something beyond sound. She wrote in her autobiography, in the wide dry washes and along the edge of the chaparral, Mary was beset with the need of being alone with this insistent, insistent experiential pain, beauty in the wild, yearning to be made human. My mother must have understood the way certain places protect and enlarge. Mary Austin called this dry side of California a big mysterious land, a lonely, inhospitable land, beautiful, terrible. It was with a mixture of insularity and permeability, peppered with the holes the desert carves, that Austin, and perhaps my mother too, met what Austin called mystery. It was in her mind, she wrote of this country, that all she needed was to be alone with it for uninterrupted occasions in which they might come to terms. What a beautiful, beautiful passage. Everyone can see your description um, and your choice of words is wonderful. When people go to your website, and I encourage them to do that, Kendra Atley, work. Um, you can see pictures of the Owens Valley, the valley and the mountain range, um, and the um, flora and the fauna. It's just absolutely beautiful. So I encourage everyone to go and look at that and see that um, in celebration of Earth Day today. So we've talked about your journey from college, Scripps College, and then I understand you went down to San Diego and um, worked at a, a museum down there. And then eventually you ended up in graduate school in Minneapolis at the MFA program. How did the MFA program help shape your writing? Um, the MFA program was super influential as far as, it I think of it as kind of an apprenticeship. Um, you work with, the program I went to, you work with, established writers quite far in their careers and they essentially they essentially just mentor you and you do a lot of reading i think reading is 70 percent in the early days and then later on at least 50 percent of the writer's work is reading bringing in other voices bringing in other techniques um and just kind of positioning yourself within a larger tradition so that was mostly what MFA was for me, was, was learning to read like a writer, um, read very carefully like a writer and kind of learn from these really admirable established writers. So do you read lots and lots of books all the time? I try to. 
<laughs> you try to, and you can see with your research that you're reading a lot of original um, newspapers and you talked about um, all the different types of research that you're actually doing. Did you read a lot during the pandemic? Or yes. did you, you did? You did, or you yes. say you have a big garden and you're working on your garden right now. Yes. Um, so what are, what are you planting in your garden? Well, I'm actually in my green, my office is my greenhouse because it's got big south facing windows and I can see all my little starts that are doing pretty well. So there's tomatoes, there's marigolds, there's peppers, there's lupin, there's, there's milkweed. I'm trying to do a bunch of pollinators. There's cucumbers that I shouldn't have started indoors because I'm still learning. So there's a lot, a lot of plants around me right now. <laughs> oh, and then as soon as the plants are um, going and um, at a substantial level of growth, then you'll plant them outside in a big um, area? Yep, we get, uh, Bishop has pretty extreme weather. So we will still potentially get freezing nights until after Mother's Day. So I'll wait for that danger to pass. Well, wait till the middle of May to do yeah. it. And, and then in the summertime, you can have weather that's up to 100 degrees or more. So um, a garden, you have to water your garden a lot, or do you provide a lot of shade for it? Or do you have a scarecrow? Um, we'll see. It's, it's a pretty extreme climate up here. Anyone who's visited in the summer probably knows that you tend to spend as little time down in the valley in Bishop during the day as you can and get up and, and get into the mountains where it's cooler. <laughs> Right. So do you go up to, um, you're living in Bishop now, do you go up to Squall Meadows a lot in the summertime? I go still... up into the mountains in general. I go hiking in the mountains a lot. Do you still have your um, father's home or did your father sell that home? It's, it's rented out still. It's rented out still. Okay. So then I also noticed that you um, gave environmental storytelling. So that was something that I read about that you did in um, do you do a lot of storytelling? Do you um, go into the schools in Bishop or you've um, graciously agreed to do this program for us? You um, I talk with lots of authors? Yeah, I don't go in anywhere because nowadays- <laughs> You can do it before this. Bef uh, before. My book came out in the middle of the pandemic, so I haven't actually gotten to do much in-person interaction. I really hope to, I would love to come down South we, sorry, we refer, we call Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles down south. <laughs> um, so okay. I would love to come to Los Angeles area and do some in-person book signings because I've got, I've heard from a lot of readers who live in the greater Los Angeles area and it's been really fun to connect with those people and hear about their relationship to the Eastern Sierra. So I'm really looking forward to being able to do some in-person stuff someday. Someday. And I noticed that you have done very nicely a lots of virtual programs. So um, your book was just published Miracle Country in March during the pandemic. How was it to get a book published during the pandemic? Because as you said, you couldn't go around and do in-person programs. You couldn't have um, autographing events. That must have been very difficult and, and a challenge. So you turned to these wonderful virtual programs. Yeah, the, the Zoom universe has, has uh, taken dominance, I think. Uh, and it'll be that way for, so there'll be a bunch more of these coming up in early June when the paperback launches. So um, there'll be a lot of conversations with different authors that are hosted by bookstores virtually. So that's fun. It's nice to, the, the, the saddest thing about missing out on the tour was not getting to connect with indie bookstores and libraries and just cool literary organizations in cities all over the West. Um, but at least that's been able to happen virtually. Right. And I noticed that you're actually going to be you're the um, statewide reading program for Nevada Reads and um, 2021. And so that's perhaps was um, postponed or you, you did part of that virtually or. Yeah, that, that's mostly happening virtually. Virtually. OK, well, you're really stepping forth and doing wonderful programs virtually to help everyone um, get to know your book. Um, so. You um, have written a wonderful, wonderful memoir. What would be your advice for someone else that wants to write a memoir? Um, well, in, in my sense, my memoir, so I, I was in my 20s for most of the time that I was writing this memoir. And it would be a little bit audacious to, I think, just say, I'm going to write just a traditional memoir at that age. So for me, it's much more, it's called a memoir 
but I think you'll probably, if you read it, you find that it, it feels more like a memoir of a whole state almost, or at least a region. It, it, my, my personal story of my relationship with the place um, and my decision to move back home, even though home was the site of fire, home was the site of loss, home was the, the site of uh, personal loss in my life, but also community-wide loss, this ongoing loss of the water, which is still felt um, very deeply here. I chose to move back here into this home of loss and kind of find the joy in it. And so for me, that was what, that was kind of the point of the memoir. It wasn't so much about telling my story as much as recognizing intersections between my story and uh, bigger, bigger picture stories. So when I started to think about the California drought got me thinking, okay, look, this is, here is loss occurring on this massive public scale. Um, and then I started looking into the history and the displacement of the Paiute and, and the way that that was a, a public loss that was shared by an entire community and the way the water loss here was shared. And that made me feel almost less alone in my own personal loss of my mother. And it made, it kind of gave me the courage to come back and sort of try to scrabble my family back together again. I now live a mile from my dad and a mile from my brother. Um, who was completely out of control for a while, it all felt beyond repair. Home felt beyond repair, environmentally, historically, and my family felt beyond repair. So the, the, the heart of the memoir is deciding to come back and kind of dig in and face the challenges of the future with that family and in that place, um, kind of despite the hard parts. So for me, it was finding the kind of the core of the memoir rather than just thinking, you know, I don't think people are going to be interested in the college times of a 20 year old, but you know, it, it, it was much more about uh, finding the bigger picture. So for memoir writing, for me, that's what it was all about. It was like, where does my story meet a larger story that will be something that other people can get something out of? That's why I think your memoir is so very wonderful to read and so important for everyone, because as you say, it discusses California history, what it's like to live in the Squall Meadows, the Owens Valley. It discusses the change in climate, the description of actually the environment, the description of the land. It gives you a wonderful sense of that whole area. And I congratulate you on putting all of that into this wonderful memoir. It was a wonderful book about climate um, and earth, especially apropos for Earth Day. So are you working on, well, you say you're doing your gardening and you're taking a break from uh, writing right now. Do you have in your mind, are you sifting through as you garden? Are you thinking about another book that you might write? Uh, maybe it's always kind of kicking around in the dark. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so are you in any writer's workshops or um, with other writers and correspond with them? Um, I have friends that I keep in touch with from the MFA program, and then there's some, some folks locally that I sometimes swap some writing with. Okay, so if you, if someone today is listening or somebody goes to the Pasadena Public Library YouTube, and they are um, someone young that wants to start out writing, what would you recommend for them to do? To just read a lot, um, put pen to pencil, or um, think of something that they're particularly interested in and do all the fabulous research, original research that you've done? Yeah, I would say if you're just starting out writing, read. Yeah, read. Read all you can read and then write as unselfconsciously as possible. I think not, not thinking about reception at first is really important. Just kind of get out of your own head. I draft everything by hand. I, I just kind of write late at night by hand because then I, I feel like it, something messy but authentic will come out and I can revise it later. Oh, and then do you um, work on your computer and put it on your computer and re revise and revise? Yes. Okay, and then you worked with an agent and worked with a, a Gwandwin Books in North Carolina. They come out with spectacular books. Um, yeah. They've been awesome to work with. Algonquin has have been a dream team. So yeah, I'm very happy, thankful for my agent for making that connection. Oh, good. So um, 
Is there some other wonderful passages that you want to read and share with us today um, about and show everyone more of your wonderful descriptions? Sure, the- I can read a little section in honor of Earth Day. Um, I can read, and also in, in, I think since this is a Southern California crowd, I can read a little section about the, um, the water relationship between our areas. So this chapter is called Whiskeys for Drinking. This is the very beginning. In Payahunadu, snow melts out of the mountains and runs toward a single river flowing south. On my father's maps, Owens River is a thin blue gro- groove at the bottom of the gorge, thickening briefly at Pleasant Valley Reservoir, then curving past the Bishop Airport around town. Even on paper, the river seems ancient, immovable. It has washed through the valley since the Pleistocene, but there's another line on this map, gray, almost graceful, dipping in and out of sight, the pipeline. When I was hardly taller than the sill, I used to look out the windows of the Redwood House and watch heat waves rise and trace the pipeline and its attendant canals until they disappeared south between the Whites and the Sierra. I can't remember a time when I didn't understand the movement of water in this valley, always south, always away. The river once emptied into Owens Lake, which was deep enough to ferry steamboats to silver mines on its shores. After Los Angeles finished draining Owens Lake in 1926, particles of arsenic and desiccated mining chemicals billowed from the bed. The wind in our valley has kicked up some of the most hazardous dust storms in the world. This used to be farming country, first irrigated by the Paiutes and the, quote, finest watered portion of the lower half of the state, according to a military scout in 1859. But after the city began piping water away in 1913, most of the crops died. Most of those who could afford to leave left. Some of the wealthiest people in Los Angeles got richer off development as land in Southern California became arable and desert was displaced to the north. On a smaller scale, Owens Valley ranchers still graze cattle and grow alfalfa on land leased from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, known locally as DWP. The water local ranchers use, water that, unobstructed, would cover this valley in green, is metered by the city hundreds of miles to the south. In dry years, Los Angeles cuts the ranchers off altogether. Call us the city's big backyard. City of Los Angeles reads signs in the desert, in vacant lots in town, private property. In 1927, the year the valley's economy completed its collapse, someone put up a sign just north of Bishop, Los Angeles city limits. Poplars, planted as windbreaks, died when Los Angeles dropped the water table below their roots. Now they lie silvery on the valley floor. They might remain for centuries in this place bathed only by fire. What a wonderful passage, and it actually shows how much research you have done and how you have put your memoir together with the California history. And people that read your book, that are maybe reading it and are not familiar with California, learn a lot about the history and the water and how that has affected your whole area and and Los Angeles. Um, It's really quite um, a wonderful thing to have part of your book and to talk about on Earth Day, how important the water is because our governor has just declared two counties in um, California for drought um, and they need to possibly start um, doing drought resistant programs um, for the people that are living there. So your book contains lots and lots of wonderful history about California. So um, are there any um, questions that anyone has? I have a question that's, would you recommend any particular time of the year as the best time of the year? to visit Owens Valley. It is it is the um, gateway to Bishop. So a lot of people travel through that. The gateway to Yosemite. Yeah, yeah it Yosemite. is. It's also to, to Death Valley, where the gateway yeah, to- Yeah, that's what I meant to. Death Valley and, so don't go to Death, you know this, you're Californians, don't go to Death Valley in the summer. Um, but uh, yeah, so it depends what you wanna do. If, if you wanna, if you want to enjoy the valley itself and kind of some of the low country hiking that we have here in Owens Valley, foothills and beautiful dry rocky hikes, that's great in the winter or in the spring or the fall. It gets really hot in the valley itself in the summer, but 
it's great to stay here and then go up into the mountains. In 20 minutes from Bishop, you can be at 9,000 feet and higher, and the temperature is 20 degrees cooler down there, and it's just, or up there, and it's just beautiful um, alpine lakes, backpacking, fishing, all that stuff. So that's in the summer. So if you like that kind of stuff, sort of like keep an eye on the snowpack and shoot for maybe July, August, early September is ideal for high country stuff. Yes, I meant to say going, everybody goes through Bishop on their way to Mammoth. Yeah. Um, yes, that I, so I miss the... sort of the Eastern Sierra, we really consider Mammoth. We're we, even within a few hour, hours north and a few hours south, we all consider ourselves sort of a unified region, the whole Eastern Sierra, pretty much from Lone Pine to Bridgeport. So can you tell us a little bit about Bishop? Um, you, you went back to it because it's really part of your family. Yeah, I, I just, memories. I'm attached to it. I wonder if I have an easy to pull up little description of Bishop in here, because I've got, I, I really enjoy describing funky little towns, my own and others. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do as a writer. Um, so Bishop is, let's see. Um, yeah, okay, here's a little, Here's a little description of Bishop. In 1906, just before construction began on the aqueduct, Mary Austin sold her house and told Owens Valley goodbye. She wrote, she knew that the land of Inyo would be desolated and the cruelty and deception smote her beyond belief. But be here for a moment now. Evening settles as we head downtown. Pop drives while I ride in the passenger seat, windows open to the dull chill of this drought January, catching the scent of dry pasture. Bishop is the self-proclaimed mule capital of the world, and every May hosts a week of mule shows, a parade, and lots of line dancing. In the metal filing cabinets of the Eastern California Museum, blocks from Mary Austin's barely changed house, I have often flipped through folders in the archives, their titles painting a portrait, bats, barbed wire, deer, fossils, fire protection, guns, ghost towns, hantavirus, sheep, saddles, I found four fat folders labeled mule days, six labeled packers and pack outfits, and three aircraft wreck, five earthquake, and more stamped water rights than I have time to count. The police blotter in the Inyo register recounts 6.11 p.m. report from South Main Street business that a raccoon dropped out of the AC unit, raccoon released in the field. On Line Street, a motel advertises Contel breakfast on one side of the marquee and Intel B breakfast on the other. Downtown features four stoplights, a few antique shops, a camera store, a bookstore, a bakery, and two coffee shops. Wander past Rosie's Palm Reading, High Sierra Crafters Mall, Taylor's Family Shoes, Joseph's Byright Market, all hunched together, Wild West style. Wilson's Eastside Sports, big and brightly lit, puts fleeces, jackets, and merino base layers on sale every spring. In Dusty's Pets, an immense blonde woman frowns as a bell jingles on the door. A clutch of teenagers saunters, wranglered and stetsoned, in town for the rodeo state finals. Tourists eat enchiladas and gaze through restaurant windows at the town going by. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, will they be having mule days this year or will that be um, postponed to another? They are having it actually. I think it's because it's pretty much almost entirely outdoors. They felt like they could go for it. Oh, good. So do you know what time of the year is that? It's obviously in the summertime kind of, or, or pre-summer. end of May. Oh, the end of May before it gets too May. hot, mm -hmm. too hot. So, um, so do you have a favorite book about California that we should um, be recommending people to read about the history or they should just go to your bibliography because there's so many wonderful books in your bibliography. Well, in the back of the book, you'll see, I have a section called resources and inspiration. Um, and it lists several really excellent books. Research and inspiration. So yeah, that lists the books that were informative to me in understanding. And I would say as far as writing about California, Rebecca Solnit, is a really excellent writer who writes very well about California and kind of combines politics and history and personal stories and just beautiful prose with um, 
with stories of California. So her book, Savage Dreams, is a massive and very well um, researched book about Yosemite and also nuclear testing in the Nevada desert. Um, so that's, it's a great big book, but it, it's really well done. And then uh, her book, River of Shadow, Shadows, Edward Moybridge and the Technological Wild West is um, about uh, the photographer Edward Moybridge in Yosemite. And, and, but it also goes into the history of the Bay Area. So that's a really great book. A contemporary memoir that just came out in paperback a day, a day or two ago is called Home Baked by Alia Vols. A-L-I-A-V-O-L-Z, -A -A Home Baked. And that's a fantastic and also really well-researched memoir about her parents in San Francisco of the 70s. Um, and they ended up being really involved in helping with, uh, helping people during the AIDS epidemic through basically starting the first medical marijuana business and sort of being at the, at the start of that wave. And so she writes about that. And it's also just, it's extremely um, beautifully done book about San Francisco in the 70s sort of brings that back to life for those of us that never got to experience it. And it's full of history. Um, and she's doing a ton of virtual events these days too, because her paperback just came out. So again, that's Alia Vols Home Baked. Oh, thank you very much. And I also noticed that um, you're referencing Wallace Stegner's Wolf Willow and, um, a History, A Story, and a Memoir of the Last Plains Frontier, and his book, Where the Bluebird Sings, To the Lemonade Springs, Living and Writing in the West. And they helped you understand the relationship to the rest of the world as being shaped by where you came from and how important how you um, live, grew up in Swall Meadows and the Bishop area. Then you went to San Diego and you went to Minneapolis. And as you said, you just saw so much green, so much water, and you really missed, as I take it from the book. And that's why you went back also for your family too and the wonderful memories you had. And you went back to Swall Meadows and um, you're living there now. So um, I thank you so much for presenting this um, for the library on Earth Day. Thank you very much. I encourage everyone to either check out the book from the Pasadena Public Library, go to the Pasadena Library's Hoopla, and you can get an e-book or an e-audio book, and you can get them right after this program. You can go to Pasadena Library's YouTube and re-see this program. And also, if you want your own copy, you can go to Roman's Bookstore. I want to say also that the Pasadena Library is very pleased that we've been able to um, add um, contactless um, use for express service in the library. And they can come into the library and browse um, at our Pasadena Central Library, at our La Pinteresca, and our Hastings Libraries for express limited service. And you can use contactless service for our curbside service at um, eight of our 10 sites for the Pasadena Public Library. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Kendra, we appreciate all of your time um, for chatting with us on Earth Day 2021. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to put into chat? Let's see before um, we just, I think that's it. So thank you much. Thank you very much again, Kendra, and happy Earth Day to everyone. Thank, Thank you for having me. Uh-huh. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.